Father, we acknowledge that you are Yahweh, O oh God. You are our God. You are the great I am. You are the Lord of our lives. In you, everything is under control. Mighty God, we are humbled to share in the things, O oh God, that you have made available, O oh God, by your grace, by your mercy, and by your love. Yahweh, we are thankful this morning. We thank you that you take care of our every need, spiritual needs, our soul needs, our physical needs, O oh God. And this morning, we come before you with expectation, O oh God, that you will enrich us, even as you prepare us to fulfill the scriptures of God. We ask for wisdom from you and ability to hear you, Jehovah Lord, when you speak to us. Be glorified, be magnified this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give him some praise. Thank you, guys. Thank you. like us to open our Bibles this morning to the book of Mark. Uh, chapter 7, we'll start with verse 1. Mark chapter 7, all the way to verse 9. Verse 9. Mark chapter 7. The Bible says, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and so some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean. Uh, that is, they were unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing. Holding to the traditions of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other tradi traditions such as the washing of cups, pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. I'll ask Pastor Mlingwa to just pray for the word. Father, we thank you this morning for the reading of your word. We pray that, Lord, the spirit that was upon the writers of this word be upon our pastor, Lord. As you reveal to him the secrets of the word, Lord, we pray that this word will change us, that we'll be able to fulfill our purpose in this generation, oh God, in these last days. We pray, Lord, for the ability to do that which you have called us to do for all of us, Lord. We thank you. We honor you this name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The title of my sermon this morning, 
It's challenging traditions with scripture. Challenging traditions uh, with scripture. We see Jesus doing exactly that to the Pharisees in the text that we have just read. You see, the Pharisees were a very powerful religious group within the Jewish community. In many ways, they were like us, Pentecostals. They believed many of the things that we believe in. They believed in the resurrection of the dead, like we do. They believed in the presence of angels and demons, like we do. They believed in the coming of the Messiah. Uh, they believed in purity. They believed in tithing. They had so many beliefs that were similar to us. Uh, they did so many things that we would do today. The problem with them is that they said many good things. But when it came to practice, they did not do it. They were pretenders in many ways. They were, you know, they looked like they were godly on the outside. But their hearts were still evil. And they held on to the traditions that were handed down to them by their fathers, obviously. The fathers. And they had a huge influence in the religious sector. Many people were Pharisees. And those who were not really Pharisees were actually agreeing to the Pharisee teachings. We are not very sure where the Pharisee group started. But it seems uh, as the Jews had actually uh, been exiled. Because of their disobedience to God, a, a group among them realized that it, they had blundered. And they wanted to go back to God. They wanted to be restored back to their land. And so they went back to the scroll to look again what the demands of God were. And they tried the best way they could to please God by their works. And so they came up with all of these rules. Uh, about 613 of them that they had to fulfill to be accepted by God. And obviously it was a heavy yoke. But many of them, especially those who were rabbis, uh, they used to show, you know, holiness by outward, ex uh, you know, expression. By the robes that they wear, they were wearing. Uh, the things, uh, it is said that when a Pharisee uh, was on the same street with a woman, uh, the woman was coming and he was going that way. He will turn to the wall and lean on the wall. So that he doesn't see the woman until she passes. It is said that if they planted spinach, for example, uh, they will count all the leaves of spinach to make sure that they are very accurate with their tithe. Like some of you, you tithe to the table. If you don't tithe properly, you feel like God is going to rain on you with thunder and lightning. So they believed in all of these uh, extreme rules. And they were extremely judgmental to those whom they considered sinners. Like tax collectors, the prostitutes, and they did not even eat with them or mix with them. That is why they had such a big problem with Jesus. How is it that he's eating with tax collectors? Why is he letting prostitutes uh, touch him? 
If he is a man of God, he will know what kind of a woman is touching you. People who are very legalistic, they are always afraid that sin from others will just jump on them and then swallow them. But those who really know God know that they are the light of the world. That when light comes into darkness, the darkness flees. They know that they are the salt of the earth. And they are to salt the earth. For salt to work, you must put it in the pot. You must mix it in the pot. God has brought you here in this world as salt to mix with this world and bring uh, taste to them. And they challenged Jesus in many instances about what they believed was wrong. I actually believe that the Pharisees were attracted to Jesus because Jesus actually preached what the Pharisees were preaching. The only problem was that he was fulfilling what he was preaching, not only preaching it. He was able to carry out the things that he was talking about while they themselves struggled. You know how it is when you have somebody who is doing something very well that you want to do, you follow them and see how they are doing it. And if you think that they are too perfect or too good, you end up trying to find some fault with them. So when they realize that this guy was doing everything right, it seemed, they were looking for things that they could point to and say, this one is not doing right. For example, working on the Sabbath. Jesus continued to heal the sick on the Sabbath. And he will tell them to take up their mats and carry it. And they used to be so angry. You see, this is what religion does to us. We fail to see what is most important. And we just want to obey the rules. Imagine somebody who has been, uh, you know, crippled for 40 years. And they are healed on the Sabbath. Instead of rejoicing that somebody is finally free after 40 years, your religious man says, no, 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 it is Saturday. It is the Sabbath. No, Sabbath. it should not happen. If it's God, it cannot happen. That is what happens when you put God in a box. The Pharisees had... Uh, you know, design the box for God. And they, they said, said, God, you work within here. We are going to manage you very well. You work within here. It's like uh, when you belong to an organized church. They tell you that you work here. You don't do this. That one is questionable. We don't do deliverance. Uh, uh, we don't do healing. It was for those uh, guys 2,000 years ago. They're trying to manage God, how God moves. The Pharisees were like that. They were struggling to do what they were teaching. Actually, it's very interesting that Jesus encouraged people to practice what the Pharisees were teaching them. Do you know that? He said, do what the Pharisees tell you to do. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Maybe you think I am, uh, you know, saying some things that are not in the Bible. It is in uh, Matthew chapter 23. Actually, if you read many verses there, you will see that Jesus was saying, do what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are telling you to do. But do not do what they are doing. Do what they are telling you to do, but do not do what they are doing. 
If you read that whole chapter, you can see clearly the irritation of Jesus uh, with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. It says the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. This is what Jesus is saying in, in Matthew chapter 23 from verse 2. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. This is Jesus talking about the Pharisees. They have the right idea. They have the right uh, doctrine. So do everything. Be careful to do everything they are telling you to do. But do not do what they are actually doing. What were they doing? They were shining prostitutes. They were shining tax collectors. They were bringing people who were caught in adultery to Jesus for stoning. You understand what was going on here? And he continues to say, Jesus says, they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. They will tell you what you must do. And this heavy burden you are carrying, while they themselves are continuing with their normal life. And he says, everything they do is done for people people to see. You see, the army that I'm talking about of the last revival, that army doesn't care about what people say. It's about pleasing the master. It's not about their image or their faces. It's about the mission that the master has given them. It says, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. They do everything for people to see. They make their place it. Place it, Place it, Place it, Place it, Place it, Place it, They make their pura puras white. And the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogue. When they enter, they need to be here is your seat. Again. Mm -hmm. uh, they love to be greeted with respect in marketplaces and be called rabbi by others. And then when you go down, I think verse 15, he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win one single convert. Do we win converts? Us. We do. So they were also winning converts. They were preaching their they are teaching. And when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. This is Jesus himself. He's saying this. He says, Woe to you, blind guides. You say, If anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You blind fools. You blind fools. Blind fool. Which is greater? The gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred. So he goes on and he is on the case. 
And at the end, chapter uh, uh, in verse 37 to 39, he cries out for Jerusalem. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophet and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather you, to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were not willing. And he says, look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. You see, Jesus had problems with this traditional leaders who somehow thought that they had uh, you know, a special relationship with God. It is a very terrible thing when you mix tradition and religion. Because when you have tradition and religion together, Humans have a sense of satisfaction and control. You see, because God is so huge, God is so big, God is invisible with our natural eyes. Many of us as human beings, we want something that we can manage. We want to have a relationship that you can manage. You want to have rules and regulations. We want to put everything in a box. But we cannot do that with God. He's so big, he's so wise. It is just vast. His thoughts are not our thoughts. But because as human beings, we always want to control things, then we will go into the Bible and pick certain things that we think will please God. And we will mix them with our traditions, our cultures, things that we honor. And we think that God honors the same thing. Amen. Amen. You know as our Africans. Right, Africa. There is a time where we had huge problems with women wearing trousers or pants. Well, we still have the Pharisees among us. When they find young people wearing camouflage, here, camouflage. they cannot enter the spirit. Because their spirit requires a dress for it to open. You know, people can just be disturbed by outward things. Forgetting that a relationship with God is a connection of their heart. Let me tell you, in the world that we live in, there are going to be many things that do not go according to your preference. Many. Today I'm wearing this uh, suit. You don't like, uh, you know, bright suits. So today you are not going to hear anything that I'm saying. You understand? Because maybe it reminds you of BPF. You know, it just depends on where your mind has been. <laughs> Next time when I'm wearing the, the red one, it reminds you of Yaron Alebanavaron. It reminds you of how us and our children. When I'm wearing a blue one. And while in the meantime, I'm just saying, hey God, which, what can I wear today? My suits are finished. Oh, that's why it's clean. Let me wear. <laughs> You see, when you are like that, when you manage God like that, you will miss a lot of what God is doing. And that's exactly what we saw with the Pharisees. They were concerned about their traditions more than what the word of God was saying. They were basically saying, God is too big. 
too far to understand. Let's make our own easy way or easy guide to follow. Three steps to God. Admit you are a sinner. Admit you are a sinner. Say with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Attend discipleship. Now you are a Christian. I get it. We always want something that we can manage that we have control over. Hallelujah. So religion will pick certain pointers and structure itself and build itself nicely. And over time, this thing becomes very strong. And if you are not careful, can close out the word of God. Your mind becomes programmed in a certain way. And it becomes very stubborn. You see, the devil knows that uh, you church people it's very hard for him to convince you that God does not exist. And so he says, okay, God exists. But uh, let's have some rules and regulations of how to relate to him. You must dress like this. Uh, you must eat like this. All of those rules and regulations. You must go to church on a particular day. It's all of the things that we do to try and manage a relationship with God. So that when we judge you, we can uh, tick. Okay, this one you are not doing, that one you are not doing. We just keep on ticking. There are many people that really impress us that we are very happy with. And we are saying these are examples. And they are far from God. That is just the reality. We have used our religious measuring stick. And we said everything is ticking. And then God says, I'm not even involved. I'm not part of that. Because you see, God looks at the heart. So traditions become much stronger when the word of God is used. Because the word of God has got authority from God. And so the Pharisees were right there in that place. So we see Jesus challenging them. Because they come to him with something that is so... Which word can I use? <laughs> huh? Something so small. The washing of hands. Hmm? Why are your disciples not following the traditions of our fathers? By washing their hands before eating. In other words, if you don't wash hands before you eat, Automatically, you are going to hell. So why are they not following these traditions? They are asking him. They say, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders? Instead of eating their food with defiled hands. They were not just unwashed hands, they were defiled. He replied, Now, Jesus is quoting a scripture that they honored or they held in authority. He's quoting one of their prophets that they respected. And he says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. You hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 
See, when you are focused only on the externals, and you work very hard to make sure that externally you appear religious, and you don't allow the word of God to change you from inside, this is the result. A heart that is far from God, but an outward exp uh, expression that says that everything is in place. And he says, they worship me in vain. The Pharisees used to go to the marketplace and they will stand in the stairs of the temple somewhere where people can see them. And they will pray, they will stand in one place praying, fasting. They did everything to show that they were godly. And Jesus says, they worship me in vain. It's a waste of time, it's vanity. When you have an outward show only, but your heart is far, it's vanity. You are How, wasting time. And he says their teachings are merely human rules. And Jesus is able to challenge them. He's able to challenge their tradition. Because he's quoting the very scriptures that they honored. He's quoting the scriptures that they held as of God. Hallelujah. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued. Almost with a sarcastic tone. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own tradition. You have a fine way of doing it. You have a very clever way of doing it. You set aside the word of God. You set aside the commands of God so that you can observe your traditions. What is important to you now is the traditions. And he's talking to the Pharisees who had traditions of worship. And He's talking to us today. We also have traditions of worship. There's a way that we do it in AFM. And this is the only way that it should be done. And God is saying, you have a fine way. You have a special way of doing it. You, you, you are able to nicely come in, push the commands of God to the side, and fulfill your tradition. In other words, the most important thing to you actually is your tradition. And so you are using the word just to stamp on your tradition. You are using the scriptures to verify your own traditions which are leading you to vanity in worship. You are wasting your time with your human Huge ropes. This is very serious. And the problem with this kind of thing is that it gives you a false sense of being holy, godly. Your dress makes you feel holy. And you judge others because you are judging them according to what you can see. You look at the way they are dressed. You look at the way they talk. You look at the way they eat. And you say they cannot be holy. And your standard is what you are observing with your own eyes. See, the Bible says God cannot be mocked. He will give every man according to what they have done. He's able to read the intents of men. Let me tell you, in the church, ne, we have Pharisees. I will not be surprised if half of us here are Pharisees. 
Pharisees are very judgmental. They are always looking at something wrong. You see, true children of God, they look at you and they say, okay, that thing is not in place. What can I do to have them to go to the right place? But a Pharisee, somebody with a Pharisee spirit, they will dismiss you. They will disqualify you. They will say you have failed because you are not up to the standard that they have set. And unfortunately, in our church, in our church, in our churches, in our church, we have our own traditions that we have set. We are Pharisees. Hallelujah. Says you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. You see, the law of Moses and the prophets, the prophetic uh, writings, had authority in the Jewish community. So they were using that to put a stamp on their traditions. So Jesus is quoting for them Isaiah. Basically to shut them up. To say, you know, you guys, what you are doing, you think it's right, you are wrong. There was a time where one of the Pharisees actually invited Jesus for dinner. You see, the Pharisees knew that Jesus had something special about him. So he invites him for dinner. He hosted a dinner. Uh, you know, for him. And while Jesus was there, there was a, a, a prostitute woman who was known in the city. Who probably was tired of the life that she was living. When she heard that Jesus was at the Pharisee's house. She forced herself. To go inside a Pharisee's house. You don't go into a Pharisee's house. As a prostitute. You want to defile, defile my home. So she went in. And when she got there, her, she, her heart was broken. She had a very expensive perfume that she had bought from the proceeds of her business. You must, you know, I mean, you must see how the religious people are looking at it. Yes, I mean, this perfume is so expensive. It is said that it is, its cost could pay you for the whole year. The whole year. So it was a very expensive perfume. Her business was booming. But she was tired. Because her business was doing well, but it was eating her from inside. She was tired of that life. You know, in that business, you need to be able to attract customers. And customers want good things. So you can imagine how she looked. She was not doing bad. She was doing very well. <laughs> she had everything in the right place. That's why she had many customers. But she was tired of that life. Because it was, you know, uh, uh, it was eating away from her soul. So she goes into the Pharisee's house. And she starts weeping. I can almost see her coming with her knees, like a, a Shona woman, she's going to be married, coming in her knees, giving the food to the husband. You know, coming that way. I could see her coming to Jesus like that. And she's crying. And her tears are flowing over Jesus' feet. As they flow, 
She takes her long hair. How many of you can wipe uh, somebody's feet with their hair? <laughs> she had long, thick hair. Jewish hair, beautiful hair. She was doing well. And she wipes Jesus' feet. Jesus is relaxing. The Pharisees are looking at it. And they are saying, if this man was a prophet, he would know what kind of a woman this is. And Jesus asks a question. He says, Peter, there were two people. One had a huge debt. Another one had a small debt. Both of them were forgiven. Their debt was cancelled. Who do you suppose will love the most? There's the one who had a huge debt. He says, you have answered correctly. This woman here, her sins are great. Ever since I came in here, you did not wash my feet. But ever since this woman came, she has not stopped washing my feet. You did not wipe my feet, but she has been doing it with her hair. You didn't pour perfume on me. You can imagine this expensive perfume just smelling everywhere. The aroma of true worship. Let me tell you something. When we are gathered here to worship God, God is looking for a contrite, a broken heart that releases an aroma of true worship. A heart that does not care about who is watching. A heart say that says, I'm here to worship God. My hair may not be right. My clothes may not be the best. You know, some people don't come to church because they don't have the right clothes. Imagine, somebody is going to miss heaven because they did not have the right clothes. Who told them they must have the right clothes? The Pharisees in the church. Hallelujah. It's terrible what we do. Now, what does this all mean for us? What is God saying? In the year 2020, our theme is the year of fulfillment. And we have broken it up in three. The fulfillment of scripture that we will see the scriptures being fulfilled. In other words, we will see what is written in the Bible becoming a reality. And what this means for us is that we must know what is in the Bible so that we will fulfill it. And also so that um, when it's fulfilled, we can say, ah, karebon. And then we say, this is what we are talking about. This has been written in the Bible. It is happening in front of us. It is a challenge for us. It is also, okay, the second part is that we will fulfill our purpose on earth. About the theme. And how are you going to fulfill your purpose on earth if you don't know what the scriptures are? Say. So it's a call to all of us to go back to the word of God and find our purpose there. The last part is a result of the first two. We will be fulfilled because we will be doing our purpose which is directed by the scriptures. So what are we being challenged with this morning? As the Pharisees had their own traditions and they were more concerned about it more than the commands of God we are challenged this morning to say that we should not be like them. 
This is to say that the scriptures that we have today are a great tool to confront falsehood that religion has presented to us. That traditions have presented to us. That the church has become today. Over many years, 2,000 years, we have evolved and today we think church is something that we know. But if you go through church history, you'll realize that church has evolved. The early church, they did not have a building like this. They met in homes. But now church is a building. That's why we are only holy when we are in the building. Because our mind tells us, no, God is in church. So when you are here, be holy. Uh, after this, do anything that you want. When you come back to church, holy. So we have been messed up in our minds. God is challenging us to know the scriptures independent of our traditions so that we may know what truth is. It's not easy. It's not easy to come to the scriptures without a particular view. But let me tell you, God wants you to come to the scriptures with an open mind, with an open heart. And when you do that, God who wants you to discover truth will come and aid you. He will come and aid you. As I conclude this morning, I want us to understand that scripture is fulfilled. When scripture is fulfilled, tradition and religion will stand against it. But our weapon will remain the scriptures. We must yearn for the scriptures. Not only for us to know the scriptures, but to see the scriptures becoming alive in our generation. You see, during Jesus' time, it was the tradition and the religion that came together to, to falsely accuse Jesus and then ultimately to kill him. This is how serious this thing is. If you do not come to God in humility and present your traditions, your religion, and say, God, is this the right way? You are going to defend your religion. You are going to defend your tradition. You are going to defend your church more than you defend your God. Let me tell you, there is no perfect church. If you find it, don't join it. Because as soon as you join it, you have spoiled its perfection. I don't even think there is anyone with a perfect doctrine. Because doctrine is we take parts of the Bible that, that agrees agree. with our way of doing things and we say, this is our doctrine. If you are AFM, this is how we do it. I get and even when uh, we read the scriptures and we see what and here this is how we do it and if you try and challenge you become the enemy 
and you will be persecuted. So Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How I have longed to gather you like a hen gathers his chicks. But you have refused. You have rejected me. He says, look, your house is left to you desolate. This is a very serious judgment. They refused Jesus. They refused God to gather them and protect them. They ran rather after their traditions and their religion. So what is left? Judgment. And let me tell you, they were judged. In AD 70, the Romans came and destroyed everything. The temple was destroyed, was bent down. The gold that was in the temple started flowing through the huge rocks, the bricks. They were scattered all over the world. The Jews. And so when the Romans came, they wanted the gold. Every stone had to be taken out so that they could uh, chop the gold out. So Jesus' prophecy came to be no stone will be left on another. When you reject God because of tra your traditions, be careful. Your house may be left desolate. You may have nothing. And you know what the sad part is? From AD 70, the Jews were scattered throughout the world. They were persecuted by Hitler. The Jews only came back to Israel, was it 1948? After almost 2,000 years. Why have they come back? God is closing this chapter called the F. So everything must be fulfilled according to the scriptures. Be careful that your tradition, your religion does not make you miss the move of God. The word of God is everything for us. Not our traditions. I want us to come before the Lord. Say, God, we realize that we have been programmed a certain way. Uh, we want to be programmed your way. We want to be renewed in our minds. We want to be able to do things your way, to see things your way. So help us if there are obstacles already in us, in our minds, in the way we see things, because of how we have been programmed. Help us to make sure that we do not set aside your commands for our traditions. That in what you are about to do, where you say, behold, I do a new thing, rivers shall flow in the desert. What you are about to do, because it's new. We will not resist it just because we have never seen it before. But we will flow with the river. Let, Let us talk to our God. Father, we want to thank you for your weight. We thank you for the impact that you make in our lives, oh God. Because of you, Heavenly Father, our lives are meaningful. We can partner with the great God, the great I am, the Lord of the universe, and be his feet here on earth, his hands on earth. We are thankful, O God. 